Whatever you need tonight, God is a He's a healer, He's a way maker, He's the answer. Numbers chapter 1 and verse 50. If you've arrived, say amen. 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 But thou shalt appoint the Levite over the tabernacle of testimony, and over all the vessels thereof, and over all things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof, and they shall minister unto it and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. They shall bear the tabernacle. Bearing the tabernacle. Bearing the tabernacle. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. It is so, so life-giving. I thank you for your people that I love so very, very much. The privilege that you've afforded me and the high honor, Lord, to stand in this place. I don't take it lightly, but lean heavily upon you and your anointing, your spirit, the word that you spoke to me. God, let me deliver it clearly that when we leave, we can be encouraged and strengthened. I thank you, God, for your people, your word. In Jesus' name we pray, and as one we say, in Jesus' name, Amen. you can be seated. Brother Johnny Dixon here. He's not here. He, you, ought, you ought to come every Sunday because I'm going to talk about him. But he, uh, Brother Johnny Dixon reads through, he's probably already almost completed the Bible. He has. He's already completed the Bible. Here we are in the middle of March. So he reads through the Bible multiple times every year, and about every couple weeks, he gives me an update where he's at, and just to make me feel bad about myself, you know. And I'm like, man, I'm the pastor. You're blowing by me, you know. He's a foof, and he's uh, he's he's reading it, and uh, he'll come up to you randomly with a thought. And last Sunday night, he came up to me and let me know where he was, and he said, man, I had this thought. He says, you know, the the tabernacle that was carried by people. He said that must have weighed a lot. And I thought. I stood right there, and all of a sudden, it just like hit me, and I, I'm not a big crier, but a tear kind of puddled up at the base, and I go into my office and sat down and kind of was overwhelmed by it. It's like, it's true, it's, it does weigh a lot. There's a, there's a weight that comes with bearing the tabernacle. It was here that I realized again last Sunday night as I sat in my office covered in sweat that what we're doing is greater than just sermonizing. What we're doing is more than just creating a place for cool songs and friendships to be made. We're doing more than, this is not just, it is not anywhere close to advancing political agendas, uh, but it is the weight of the tabernacle and the establishing of God's kingdom in this generation. That is, my dear friends, what's taking place here at Eastgate United Pentecostal Church. I, I remember as a young man, I had no greater desire than to be a preacher. Preachers to me, because it, largely because of how I was raised. There was no celebrity that was grander than to be a preacher. My, my, our, our home, uh, of course, we had no television, no movies, and so there were none of that. The, the discussion was continually about preaching, preachers, church. Our, my, my entire childhood re revolved around it. I, I think I've told you that eventually, when I was 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there, my parents brought in, I think I was 12 actually, they brought in this uh, VCR thing for a Becca video. They had taken me out of school. The public school system there was a disaster. And so now I'm doing a Becca homeschool on video. Thank God for fast forward. <laughs> Got through those classes like <clears throat> lightning, you know. My, uh, um, my grandmother heard that I had this uh, VCR and she would send boxes of videos over uh, videos of uh, Louisiana camp meeting and because of the times and all kinds of uh, recorded preaching. And so as a young man, I would, it was the only thing I was allowed to watch. And so I would, I would uh, have my little VCR player thing, little tiny screen, it's black and white, and I'd put Lee Stone King in. Yeah. And I had my little cover, I'd pull my cover up over me, man, me and Lee would go to town. And then Wayne Huntley would preach and Jeff Arnold would preach. T.F. Tenney would preach. And they, the, these guys, they were, don't shoot. You never know. These guys were my heroes. As a matter of fact, they were my movie stars. You came back to America and all the kids at youth camp are talking about Tom Cruise. And I'm like, well, have you heard Coming Out of the Cave by Jeff Arnold? And they're like, Jeff who? movie stars, my heroes, 
they were preachers. I loved it. I, I, a matter of fact, I loved preaching so much I would, I would correct my father. <laughs> After every sermon, I would tell him, now, if you'd have done this, that, and the other, that would have been a really good message. <laughs> he blew me off. So now if you, you know, now here we are, and, and I preach his messages. And he, he's like, that's my message. And I, I'm like, yeah, it's a whole lot better too, isn't it? <laughs> I'm like, they don't invite you back to preach them. They invite me back. And I've been telling you that for 20, 30 years, how to make that message better. But I was scared, you know, I was scared. I was scared to, it freaked me out. The thought of standing in front of people preaching, but I, I loved it. I, so I'd set up an ironing board in my, my room. My mother's ironing board, it was stained. And uh, I had a hairbrush. The hairbrush was my microphone, Brother Rose. And the ironing board was my pulpit, my lectern. And behind that ironing board, and with that et hairbrush, every hair left in it got to be anointed. <laughs> I preached some of the most powerful sermons. I would... I would weep over that ironing board. I, one time I broke it because I just hit it so hard. I would, but I was anointed. I, I could feel the power of God as it would come over me in my bed. My teddy bear was very blessed. It's funny to you, but I saw thousands from behind my stained ironing board. They all said amen and all loved me. They all paid their tithes and no one complained. It was great, that feeling of anointing, the power. As I would preach as a 9-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old little boy. I still do it. I still get my hair, but you ask Michelle. Look at her. I'm just going to tell the truth. She'll come in sometimes. I'll be in that bathroom preaching to my, preaching to my hairbrush. It works for me, you know what I mean? I didn't think I could ever do it for real. Uh, matter of fact... One of the first times I, I was asked to preach, I, I didn't eat for like five days. Thank God, because when I got up there, I started dry heaving. <laughs> had I eaten, I'd have thrown up literally all over the entire platform. One time, I, the, the, a few times later, they had me testify, and my nose just started bleeding all over the place. I was so, so afraid. I, I didn't think it would be attainable, and, uh, but I sure wanted to. But I made this promise. I remember Oregon District Camp Meeting. I was 15 years old. Brother Greg Godwin had preached. I stood to your left, my right, right about there. I'll never forget that night. I just raised my hands and I said, God, I'm going to make you a promise. I'll always say yes. That's all I said. I'll always say yes. I'll never say no. Whatever you ask me to do, no matter how scared I am, no matter how little it pays, and even if it doesn't pay, I'll go. If you want me to go to China, I'll go. I'll, I'll just say yes. If you ask, here I am. I'm available. That was my prayer. God put me to the test quite quickly because after that summer youth camp, I returned back to the Netherlands and dad, he appointed me as the chair setter upper and cleaner of the floors at the community center that he had rented in The Hague. That community center, for you, that's like, uh, that was a big deal. There was all kinds of garbage all over the place all the time. And and I would clean and set up chairs. And then he said, Matt, we need, we need drums. Well, we couldn't afford a drum set. Plus, we had to set it up and tear it down every single time. So we got a single snare. And I was the drummer, literally drum, singular, not drummers. I, I, I didn't have drums. I had a drum. And I would beat that thing, you know. And then we needed a bass player. I, I play the bass. Like, I can play G, C, D, do, 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 do. That's my bass playing skills. But we needed a bass player, and I'd made a promise. My promise was I will always say yes. Then I needed a, he needed a song leader. It got worse. It just got bad to worse. <laughs> I was the song leader. And then I was the youth team member and moved to Indiana and became a youth leader, youth pastor, administrative leader, everything I was asked. Hey, would you lead the outreach team? Yeah. Would you lead the prayer ministry? Yeah. Thank God I never got asked to lead the ladies' ministries. <laughs> I'd had to say yes. 
And then uh, I moved to Texas and working for my father-in-law, he gave me this grand promise about how great Texas was. And all my dreams would come true in this great place. I arrived and moved into uh, Space 38 in the trailer park, a 1961 single wide with no floor in it, basically. And I'm not kidding, I had to put the floor in. And then my assignment, my assignment in this grand ministry was to be the trailer park manager. And the first assignment was that I had to change the, the main, sewer main, right down the middle. There was no backhoe or track hoe. There was a shovel in me. And I dug up that main drain, and he didn't tell the tenants to stop using the bathroom. <laughs> when they showered, it was wonderful. Because that soap would wash away all the rest of the stuff that had been floating over my boots. I never miss church. I made that promise. I'll never miss. It's, it's, this is what I'm called to be. I would watch preaching and I'd still set up that ironing board. And I'd preach across it. I, I've learned that when you master the small things and you make them a high priority in your life, God can trust you with the great things. I've learned that you should run to prayer and walk to pulpits. You should run to prayer rooms and walk to pulpits. It was David that won the battle and he became king because he, he mastered not the kingly things. He mastered a slingshot. Something that everybody else would have seen, just it's just insignificant. But he said, I'm not just going to know how to use a slingshot. I'm going to be so good that I can kill a giant while running with at least five stones. All I need is five, and I can kill anything moving. That's how good he got. Now, anybody else said, oh, man, that stupid little slingshot. You're, you know, that's never going to get you anywhere cleaning the carpet. That's never going to get you anywhere just dancing and shouting and worshiping. Oh, leading the men's ministry, that's not going to get you anywhere. Oh, serving on the ushers team, that's not important, but the devil is a liar. So I'm going to be the best usher I can be. I'm going to be the best Sunday school teacher I can be. David wasn't practicing with, practicing with his slingshot, mastering this seemingly insignificant thing with the intent to kill giants or be a king. We all know that he wasn't out on the hillside slinging rocks thinking, man, one day, <laughs> you know, if I do this long enough, I'll get up to be the big dog. No, he was just doing it because it was the right thing to do. He was doing it because he cared deeply about the sheep in the, in the pasture that weren't even his sheep. Uh, when they were shorn and the money was, was dispersed, he received nothing of the money. He cared for another man's sheep uh, so much that he would risk his own life. Uh, he cared so much that he would dedicate hours of his time uh, to keep them safe. And it is those kinds of people that God looks down at and says you know what you might not be the best looking you might be the eighth of all the lineage you might not have it all together you might throw up when you try to preach your nose bleeds you're balding you're weird you're from Holland but you know what every time I put you in a pasture you care about sheep every time that I ask you to do something you don't just do it half hearted you're not just on you're not just there when the spotlight's on you're there at maintenance work day you're there at cleanup day you're there at service in the parking lot so I'm going to use you those are the type of people that God uses to bear the burden of the tabernacle and I'm going to tell you there's no greater joy than serving God that the same anointing that I feel when I preach behind that ironing board I would feel it when I was serving God's people in whatever capacity that I got to serve in because ladies and gentlemen everything in the tabernacle was anointed it wasn't just up here it's, you know there's an anointing for the person that grabs a vacuum cleaner and starts vacuuming you know there's an anointing on a, can I get some choir members that, that have ever stood up here in the tenor section. Come on, you're not even up here because you sing good. You're just up here because you dance. But you've got to be just as anointed as the soloist. There's an anointing that comes with serving God. And it's glorious. It's wonderful. It's the grandest and the greatest thing you'd ever do. Here I am now in the big leagues. <laughs> Those were my slingshot moments, my, my ironing board and my hairbrush. I overcame Michelle making fun of me. 
So baby, it's working. And now the ironing board is this really modern looking lectern thing. It's actually very expensive. It's amazing that this thing costs a lot of money. It's so cheap, flimsy looking, isn't it? Look at it, just wobbling all over the place. Stupid, but it's in style, so we gotta be in. But I've stood behind the biggest and the most expensive electrons. I've stood around behind pulpits that you had to literally find a map to figure out how to get out of them. They were so big. <laughs> My brush is like a thousand dollar microphone now. <laughs> I was gonna say, this is awesome. And what a harvest we're in. What an amazing harvest we're in. I mean, we have more cars than we do spots. More saints than we have seats. We have more visitors than we have vans. We have more staff than we have space. We've got the greatest cadets. I don't even have to get my own props anymore. I just send a text. I'm like, hey, here's what I need. It just shows up magically. Hey, if you're on my cadet team, stand up. I don't give you credit. Wallow was today. He served me. If you're a cadet, stand up. You serve me. Amen. Where are they? There's some others. George Dearborn, right? There's Chandler Wilkins. Amen. There's some others. I guess they're probably out still getting all the rest of the props. Oh, there's Noah. Why don't you give these guys a big hand? Anything you see happen is because they make it happen. I have my own parking spot and pastor the most amazing people, and that's you. I can't believe it. There's no words. I can't express it, but I can say that I did see you. I saw you as a nine-year-old little boy. I saw you from behind a stained ironing board holding a hairbrush. I didn't know your names at the time, but I knew the day would come. The day would come that what God was putting in me would come to pass. I dreamed it. I believed it. I said yes, and here we are today. What an amazing and high honor it is. But while I've seen you, I must say there's more to the dream. This was just one part of it. The children of Israel have come out of Egypt in our text. It's what they dreamed of. They said, God, get us out of here, and we will go worship you. We will praise you. We want to, we want to be free, not for ourselves. We want to be free so that we can bring you glory. And that's why God brought them out. Amen. God will give you victory if your intentions are right. God bless me, but he knows, the, he knows the thoughts and the intention, and he discerns between them. Uh, why do you want to be blessed? I'll tell you why. Uh, we want to build a building. Why do we want to grow? I'll tell you why. Uh, not that we can glory in ourselves, uh, but so that we can see more people uh, go to heaven than go to hell. Uh, we, we want to give the devil a nightmare. Uh, we want to rob and rescue uh, every wayward son. Uh, we want to take every drug addict uh, oh, from the streets. We want to we deliver those that are bound up in greed and lust, thinking money and accolades and power. Oh, we want them to experience a power. That's the goal. That's the goal. I dreamed it. I, I believe with all of my heart that, that the dream points you to the thing. I, I've told some men that I teach on a monthly basis uh, about it, but you, you, have, to have, a, you have to have a vision um, like I said, before I, I preached, I, I saw you. I, I could see it. I knew it was going to happen. I, I could feel it. Even though I was scared, I knew just God had given me this, this vision to happen. I, I remember, and I, I don't think I've told you, maybe I have, but here we are. <laughs> and uh, we were pastoring in Holland. And um, I, 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 when I left Holland, I was 17 years old. And I had made a promise to myself that I would never go back. I'd go back to visit mom and dad until they retired and then I would never step foot on that awful place again because while you may think it's cool to visit, it's not cool to live in. It was a rough, 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 rough uh, time living for the Lord there. Many challenges. I lived for the Lord, but it was through great, great struggle. And it's cold. I didn't like the climate on top of that. I didn't like the food. I really didn't like much about it. I said, I'm never going back. And... Um, when I was 28 years old, Dad called and said, uh, he said, Matt, I need you to come. I want you to pastor this church in, uh, that I've started because I've been elected to serve as the regional director. And um, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just evangelizing. He said, I got a couple years booked. Things are going pretty good. He said, uh, well, it's God's will that you, that you come to Holland and pastor this church. 
I'd made this promise when I was 15 years old down at the altar with Greg Godwin preaching. And the promise was, I'll always say yes. I said, Dad, how long are we talking? He said, just a year, son, just a year. I'll find a replacement and you can come back. I said, okay, one year, good. I didn't even resign my sectional youth position because I'm like, I'm coming back to the glory land. By now, I'm out of trailer spot 38, and I got a nice house. I'm a mile down from my in-laws. We got the pool cooking. I'm into crawfish. I figured out how to peel them finally. You know, it was great, and uh, things are great. So I'm headed back. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're in. We're, we start this church, and things are actually going pretty good. And a year to the date, it was unbelievable. Michelle can tell you, my phone rang. It was uh, Franklin Howard from Cleveland, Texas, and he said, Matthew, the, the church I pastored in Los Angeles, uh, Van Nuys, right by Hollywood, wants you to come. Their uh, pastor has resigned. It's a church of 120. Here's the income. Here's the opportunity. Well, what's crazy is when I was just a young teenager, we'd go through L.A., and I remember thinking of all the places to live, this would be the one. The weather's perfect. I like Tex-Mex, but I'm going to tell you, if you have that SoCal Mexican food, it's really good. And sorry to bust your bubble, but it really is good. And I, I remember thinking, this is it. This is the dream, you know. And, and uh, I remember telling Michelle, can you believe it? They want us to pastor in Hollywood, Van Nuys. It's going to be amazing. Let's go. So they flew our entire family over, put us up in this fancy hotel. We preached. I uh, met the board. We had six or seven get the Holy Ghost. And they said, we want you to be the pastor. And I said, oh, this is grand. <laughs> wow, I'm wanted. It feels so great. And... Um, they said, we've got to have an election to make sure, you know, to get everybody on board, but it's going to be fine. So we went back to Holland, and Michelle and I, we, we talked. And um, Michelle just said, I don't know. I just don't have peace about it. I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> like, did you not see the palm trees? Like, what, were you not looking? Like, we were at the presidential suite, and that, that was nice. She said, I don't know. I don't have peace about it. I said, why don't we fleece the Lord? We'll both, we'll both pray both fast and we'll meet back in three days and then we will um, we will tell each other the number that the Lord has given to us and so um, the election was going to be a week after then so we had some time so anyway three days later we meet back at the dining room table or wherever we met I can't remember and I said I believe that we should go if we get 80% of the vote and she said well I feel like it's 90% the vote. I'm like, oh, come on. You got to give some space for the people that don't hear from God. <laughs> but being we're married and we have a wonderful marriage and you're going to learn how to do this at the marriage seminar, we settled at 85. <laughs> Art Hodges, the superintendent of the SoCal district, called me the night of the election. Congratulations. Pastor Tuttle, you've been elected to serve as the pastor of Van Nuys United Pentecostal Church. Man, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> that sounded good, Pastor Tuttle in L.A. And um, I said, well, I said, just for information purposes, what was the percentage? He said, 83. I said, well, brother, let me call you back in the morning. It's 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever. I'll call, let me wake up my wife. Next morning, I, well, not next morning. I just woke her up right then and there. Bam, baby, they voted us in. How much? 82. She said, guess we're not going. <laughs> I called him back the next day, and I said, uh, we'd fleece the Lord. It was supposed to be 85%. He said, oh, brother. I said, well, I understand. He called me back within an hour. He said, Brother Tuttle, he said, the board has asked you to reconsider giving you two weeks to pray and fast. And they wanted you to know that there was a lady and her daughter at the red light. And there was a wreck that happened. And that wreck prevented them from coming, but they were a yes vote. It would have put you at 85 on the money. I said, I'll make sure and tell her. Um, we're going to talk about this. Michelle said, well, don't you think God controls the lights? I still gave him two weeks. <laughs> I 
call back and I said, I'm not, not going to come. I'm, I'm going to stick to what I fleeced, the Lord. And, uh, and I didn't. I didn't go. And we stayed another four years in, in Holland. And, and after that, Michelle and I made a promise to one another that we were going to just live for God. And I'm sorry, serve God in that area like we were going to live there the rest of our lives. We're like, you know what? It's, it's so frustrating always living, looking for the next spot. Well, what does God have next? And you miss out on what God has now. And an entire year of my life, maybe that's why I say that so much. Because I basically lost this entire year where I was just like, you know, waiting for whatever God had next. And I missed out on what God had then. And in that next four years, uh, we baptized, I think, seven or eight hundred people. We started two or three new churches. We remodeled an old house that... God blessed us financially unbelievably in that season of our lives and, and ministries and, and it's, it just created a bond between us and that church to the place where we were like, man, we'll, we're never leaving. This is home. This is grand and great. But, but I, I didn't love it still, but kind of learned how to love it. You know what I mean? And I remember Easter Sunday of 15 when I was preaching holiday youth convention here in the Texas district and Brother Brian McCoy, the youth president, sorry for taking your time, but whatever, I got the mic. And and this is the story. It's a good story. Amen. And he said, I want you to come uh, and bring your entire family. He said, uh, we will cover their entire, uh, all their airfare if you'll commit to preaching on Easter Sunday um, so that we can pay their way. I said, sure, that's, no, that's a good deal. I got, I'm a baby making machine, dude. Like, I mean, you're in trouble. <laughs> and so he's like, all right. So I brought all the kids and, uh, that we had at that time. And uh, he, he, he had me preaching on Sunday. Well, he had me going three services on Sunday. Sunday morning, that was right here at Eastgate. Sunday afternoon, somewhere else. Might have been over in Conroe. And then Sunday night, somewhere else. And, and I remember I preached here on that Easter Sunday. And it was Easter Sunday at Eastgate back in those days when things were green. Yeah. <laughs> and back in the green days of Eastgate on Easter Sunday, people weren't really coming to shout. They were coming to show off their hair bows and hats. And I'm a crazy missionary. I mean, I got a bunch of first generations. They shout and dance at the Christmas banquet. And I'm looking at these high flute and hoity toity, high dollar expensive, multi generational Pentecostals, and they're like, show us what you got. It was kind of hard to preach, honestly. And I remember I got in the car and I said, that was hard. Michelle said, whew, that was hard. <laughs> But then I said, you know what's crazy? I said, at the end of that message, I stood behind the pulpit. I remember I looked right over there, and I looked all across. Didn't I, babe? And I saw it full. And I told my wife, it's crazy. It was hard, but I, I see what it could be. I see what it could be. While I was trying to go, and I was wrestling. I wrestled so much, you know, with the, in that two-week period, and in Los Angeles trying to make that decision because I wanted it so bad. And, and my wife is an amazing wife. I give her a hard time. She doesn't beat me up that hard after church. She, she really doesn't. It's, it's just... It's, right. it's, right. it's real soft. But <laughs> she would have gone if I'd have said, it's right. And I remember in that struggle, you know, I was like, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, where do I go? What do, I wanted so bad, you know, to go. I remember I was talking to an elder of my friend who loved me so much, and he'd call me every day to check on me. Finally, one day he said, Matthew, what's your vision for that church? What are you going to do when you land in L.A.? What's the first thing? And I remember I went, he said, there's your answer. You don't have a vision. He said, if you don't have a vision, you should never go. That gave me such peace. As I stood here that day, I remember, I walked, got in that car and I told Michelle, I said, I, it's hard, it's cold, it's not like what I'm used to with new converts doing backflips and, you know, just all of the things that I had grown accustomed to the church and the type of church that I pastored. I said, but I, 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 I see something there. Someone one day will take that church to a, a place that is going to be amazing. I had no idea it was me, but I could see it could see it and then I remember Bishop he asked me just a couple months later if I would come my initial thought was I never said it initially because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings you know it's like oh there's no way yeah 
I'm, I'm, I'm good. But I said, I'll think and pray about it. And I'm pulling out of the parking lot, and I called Michelle. And Michelle said, well, we should pray about it. My dad said, you should pray about it. And then I remember I got back to Holland, and I remember that vision. I remember what God had showed me in that moment. And it was then as I began to pray and I began to fast that I remember thinking, man, if I was there, you know what I'd do? I'd have a school back in that gym. You know what I'd do? I, I, I'd remodel that thing, and I'd, I'd update the front a little bit because, boy, that's an ugly front. It can be beautiful. <laughs> just needs a little plastic surgery, you know what I mean? And I, I'm not trying to throw stones at y'all, but these are just what I thought. I thought if I put new pews in there and I widened them up so we could run those aisles, and if we got bus ministry going, and I think if we just had apostolic, just good old-fashioned church, that there's a hunger in Texas. I know there's a lot of churches, but I believe there's a hunger there for people that, that they want that old-timey aisle running, pew jumping, a holiness, righteous living up. I, I, I would go and watch online at other churches and it turns into disco bar and I'm not trying to throw rocks but I just thought man surely there's a people that want the kind of church I grew up in uh, where, where, where you shout and you dance and, and bobby pins fly and I thought man we could have that there, there's got to be a drug addict there that, that'll shout with me I know that the hoity toities and you know the multi generations that they're, they're glued to their seats I probably won't get them but I'm not going to let them frustrate me I know how to go into Amsterdam where there's no Body and I can pull. I, can, I won lawyers and I won doctors there and I, I won the down and the outers and if I can do it there, surely I, I can do it here. He showed it to me. Just like the children of Israel who had been in bondage for all those years. They dreamed of being free like I dreamed of what would ha happen here. We're going to have a place of worship and it'll be amazing. It'll be beautiful. God, it'll be great, man. We're going to have a tabernacle. It'll be so, so incredible. It'll be filled with no doubt. Oh, man, I'm sure we'll have, we'll have all kinds of ministries. We'll have gold, the gold ministry. We'll have the silver ministry, the bronze ministry. We'll have the leather ministry. We're going to have, they have all these different ministries uh, that they were dreaming of when they got in, and so they did. They got out of that place. Uh, and, and, and God gives the instruction to his man. He says, all right, it's time to build the building. We're going to build it in Exodus 38 and 24. He says, look, get all the gold that was occupied for the work in all the work of the holy place, even the gold of the offering uh, that was 29 talents and 730 shekels uh, after the shekel of the sanctuary. He said, now you're gonna need a big box. Get my big box. He says, you're gonna need a box because you're gonna have to, it's portable. We're gonna, we're gonna be a kingdom that's always advancing. He said, the first thing we're gonna do is know this, uh, that the tabernacle is always gonna be moving forward. Uh, we're gonna always be moving towards the promised land because... Uh, the wilderness was never the destination he said so we're going to have a place that we're going to build and it's going to be filled it's going to be filled with 29 talents 730 shekels so now I need you to go get 29 talents 730 shekels of gold go quickly my friends go quickly I just gave you a lot of credit or live up to it <laughs> then he said I, I, I want us to have this gold 29 talents and 730 shekels he says and then I need silver of them uh, that were numbered of the congregation uh, that was about was a hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifty shekels he says what I need you to do next uh, is get one hundred talents uh, one thousand seven hundred and sixty five shekels uh, of silver get them in there Ooh, it's going to be bad. This, this, this thing is going to be amazing, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he says, and then a becca for every man, that is half a shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone that went to be numbered, from 20 years old and upward, for 600,000 and 3,000 and 550 men. So half a shekel divided by that number is about 330,000 shekels of Put it in the box. We're going to build us a sanctuary and it's going to be amazing. That's not enough for our, our God, though. We want to make sure we have the talent of silver. <laughs> so make sure, verse 27, that you have the talents of silver. We're cast in sockets and sanctuary. And the sockets of the veil and a hundred sockets of the hundreds of talents, a, a talent for a socket. So I need a hundred talents of silver. Go get them and go quickly, dear cadets. We are filling this thing up. I know what a building we're going to build. It's going to be incredible. And 1,770 and five shekels make hooks. I need you to get 1,775 hooks real quick. Run down to M&D. And, oh, 
They already did it. I told you I had the best cadets. Look at them, look at them, look at them building this thing. Get the brass. Boys, get the brass. That's the next verse. The offering of 70 talents and 2,400. That's 70 talents, 2,400. Amen. Go ahead and get that. Boy, is that the brass? Okay, good. Thanks for getting the brass. Putting the brass in the box. Got to get the brass. This is, boy, isn't this great? Are y'all excited about this tabernacle we're about to build? It's good. We dreamed about it. I remember when I was in slavery, I was bound, but there was going to be this place I would go into and I'd feel its glory. It was going to be like no other place on earth. I saw it in my slavery. I saw it in my back and it was filled. It was amazing. It was majestic and glorious. And the brass was there, but, but that's great. We got the gold, we got the silver, we got the brass, but baby, we ain't even got started. We got to get the linens. So the linen curtains would be 10 embroidered sheets of 24 by 4 cubits. That's 1,120 square cubits, meaning 1,022 square feet. Go ahead and get my, get my linens. And, and then, of course, we need the sheets. There's eight of them, 30 by 50 cubits, which would be 1,323 feet of, of sheets. And then, of course, we need the embroidery curtains. For the most holy place, 250 square cubits, that would be 225 square feet. Please continue to bring my stuff. I know I'm going quickly. but And then I need the embroidery curtain for the tabernacle entrance, 40 by 50. Uh, if this bores you, you're sure going to hate the building program. It's 182 square feet would be the total dimensions there. So make sure you get those embroidered cloths for the holy place. Put them in the, put them in the box. That's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. So I need a total, a total of embroidery curtain, a total here of all the fabrics. Uh, was going to be 2,637 square feet of fabric. And I need that all to be to where we can transport it. That's grand, right? Are y'all excited about the fabrics? Y'all excited about the gold? Y'all excited about the silver? Y'all excited about... Oh, we didn't even get going. We got the goat's wool ministry. Put... Y'all got my goat's wool? Bring the goat's wool. Ladies and gentlemen, 11 curtains measuring 30 by 4 cubits would be 1,250 square feet. Put it in the box. Curtains of goat's wool interwoven with ram's wool also has to be put in. 5,000 square feet is about 4,000, I'm sorry, square cubits, 4,843. This took a lot of time studying. On spring break, give me a hand. Y'all are all fishing, and I'm figuring out 5,000 square feet cubits into 4,843. Come on, somebody. You got a good pastor. Yeah. yeah. You got a great pastor. But you got an amazingly non-abusive pastor's wife. Amen. I got in trouble for telling that she abused me. So that's why I'm making it right. 538 square feet of leather. That's 150 pounds of leather. It's pretty amazing. Put it in the box. The weight of a shekel is one, between 11 and 4 uh, and 14 grams. And so we would calculate it all out. Just the metals of loan would have been between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds in the box. Of course, that's, that's not it. We've got the wood. Acadia wood. Y'all, did y'all bring my Acadia wood? The beams and crossbars, the pillars and posts. We got 33,306 pounds of wood. Bring it on, boys. Put it in the box. We're building a tabernacle. And it's going to be like anything you've ever seen. It's going to be huge and beautiful. It'll be the most majestic thing, but it'll also be moving towards a promise. It's not just going to be beautiful to show off to the people around us. It's going to be a place that takes us uh, to what God has for us. It's going to be a place where his glory meets us. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Have you got it all? Oh, man, look at the wood. We got the wood. And as they continue, I did the math. On the light end, the tabernacle would have been 8,000 pounds to 10,000 pounds. That box on the light side weighs 8,000 pounds. And that's the vision. Pastor, we want a church. Do you want a church? Are you happy with where we're at? Or is there something in the jungle of slavery we're in that says there's a better place? Pastor, let, I, know, I know it's big, but let's build something better. And when we get there, 
Let's have a place that's not just a place to show off. Let's t- let it be a place that takes us to the promise that God has for us. Let it be a building where his glory comes and visits us. Let it be a place where he demonstrates his power, where truth triumphs from the most majestic place, where holiness is celebrated and righteousness causes the people to rejoice. Let it be the place where one God is declared. Where Come on, where Jesus named baptism is practice. We're speaking in tongues. The gifts of the spirit and the miraculous are ordinary. I want to have a great church. In our next church, I I think we should have a nursery ministry. Anybody want a nursery ministry? Any of the mothers want a nursery ministry? Do I have the nursery ministry? Do do I have the nursery? Get my nursery ministry. I I need need the nursery ministry. I'll wait because the baby's always, you know. How many of you think we should have a kids ministry? Y'all want to? Oh, hold on. I think the nursery ministry belongs to her. Go ahead and give the nursery ministry to her. Any of them. How, who wants the nursery ministry again? Who was it that wanted the nursery ministry? Oh, wow. Now that I got weights, nobody lifts their hands. Okay, go ahead and put your ministry in the box. Yeah, go ahead and put it in the box. Bring out the kids ministry and put the kids ministry in the box because we want it. How many of you think we should have another coffee shop because we love the Tuttle Flat White and it should never cease? Let that be written, declared, and said forever it is settled, both iced and hot. Should we have a bookstore ministry? How about let's, I'm letting y'all vote on the next building. Y'all want a bookstore ministry? Bring the bookstore ministry. Put the bookstore ministry in. How about a choir loft? Y'all think we should have a choir ministry? I mean... Put the, put the choir ministry in. Put the choir ministry in. Now, I'm going to tell you what we're going to have to have is going to have to have screens. Because nowadays, y'all forget to bring your Bibles. I say we have a giant, giant screen. You know, so when we superimpose my face up there, it looks really big. Y'all want to y'all have screens? Let's do screens. Good. We're voting. We're voting. If y'all, if y'all don't want to do it, that's fine. But should we have bathrooms? What do y'all feel? Like one toilet? One, like one toilet, one urinal, urinal for the guys. We learned how the monkeys did it. We could do that, you know. How about 40 toilets? Y'all good with 40? Let's do 40. 40. Put the toilets in there. That would be the toilet ministry. You know, I think it'd be great. I want to have a play, like a jungle gym playground in there for our kids. Y'all want to do that? Wouldn't that be great? Let's throw that in. Let's throw it in there. Throw it in there. Nursing, money, nursing mother's ministry wouldn't that be great throw that in there that would be great throw a nursing money I want to have one of those young people are we going to have youth ministry throw a youth ministry hyphen do I have anybody that's college and career that wants to have a co- do I have any singles that want to have singles ministry Ooh, this, that's why you're still single you got to get excited and pretend like you like it it makes the others think that you, come on it, it's that hard to get thing you got to do it you got to learn it how about the newlyweds oh we got to have newlyweds divorced singles ministry junior high ministry how about all the ladies y'all want ladies ministry room Ooh, let's do ladies ministry how about a school and a men's ministry? You want to do that? Wouldn't that be great? How many of you are excited about all the incredible ministries that are going to take place at Eastgate Church? It's piling up to look beautiful. It's going to be, um, I mean, I've already said amazing. Michelle says I use the word too much. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be outstanding. It's going to be grand. It's going to be grandiose. It will be, in- oh, And it will be what God uses to advance righteousness and holiness. Now, pastor, we're all for it. Now, we need you to to carry that for us. And while you're carrying it, make sure you got a masterpiece on the AM, PM. And I'm going to complain if you're not preaching on the Wednesday night. It's easy to put ministries in the box, but the burden is carrying the box. I want it. This is the part of pastoring I didn't realize. I saw that in my dreams. I saw this in my dreams. 
of that is what it's really about. The only way we can advance into what God has for us next, there's only one way. There's only one way we can get this thing. There's only one way I can get this thing moving. There's only one way that I can get this thing moving. There's, there's a way. I know there's a way. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. Surely there's a way we can get this thing moving. Surely there's, surely there's a way. I knew we could do it. I knew we could move it. I, I knew the mission could advance if we would take it out of one man's hands. Let the one man dream and let the others labor. Oh, bear the burden of the tabernacle and let's bear it together. Well, I'm not... I'm not the priest. Oh, you ought to read your Bible. You're a royal generation. You are a royal priesthood. Every one of us carry the burden. Every one of us get under the... If you want a nursery ministry, start carrying it. If you want a youth ministry, start carrying it. If you want a hyphen ministry, start carrying it the burden of the tabernacle. How are we going to do it? I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do it. I didn't know how we'd fill this building up. Look around, it's full. I didn't know how we'd pay the teachers at the school, but we did it. I just kind of believe if I knew how it would be done, it wouldn't be God's idea. I can see it. I'm not sure how we get there, Brother Logan, but I know if God gave the vision, then he'll give the provision. His, his finger never points where his hand fails to provide. If he said, go, I will be with you. How do we get there? Here's the one thing I know. I don't know how, but I know I'm not going alone. I didn't even have to ask them. They came up here and said, we'll go. You just, we'll go. You just lead on. Pick it up. And here's the trap. And here's how the enemy works. preacher gets all the credit around here you know what you should do Quit. you know what you should just let God you should go start your own thing I mean he's just got you doing all the work you're just a little box bear you're not the, you know you know hey they made fun of you the other day and they were talking leave walk away from that and that's you you got he, he, he was talking about you when he was preaching the other day you know why don't you go over there and start your own little hey you know you, he doesn't give you enough time on the base. He doesn't believe in your ministry. Hey, you know what you should do? Everybody makes fun of you. And they're not really for you. And you know what? On your own, by yourself, you could start your own church. You, you don't have to carry. I mean, you're not that important. You're really not that valuable. You're, oh, there you are going the extra mile like you always do. You're not that important. You're just, you're overlooked. He never even gives you the credit. Hey. Remember the last time the guest preacher was here? Did he even acknowledge you? No, he didn't. You know what you should do? You should leave and you should quit. Hey, you know what? You, you've been laboring so hard. All you do is the toilet ministry and the toilet ministry isn't really that important. Seems like by now he would have recognized that you are worthy of a five minute of fire spot. You should just walk away. You should give up. Hey, you know what? You, you know what? That marriage ministry testimony, they're gonna make fun of you. You're a loser in the marriage ministry thing. You should be the pastor because because you are more powerful than him. Look at his bug bolt. Yeah. Hey, you. Hey, you're too new. You're too, too new and you're way too old. Get out of here. You're way too. And if you start believing the lie, hey, it's just prayer meeting. It's just prayer meeting. It's not that big of a deal, man. It's just outreach. It's just men's work day. It's just men's work day. And if 
you start believing the lie that you're of no value and you start believing the lie that your position isn't powerful and that somehow you need to be in a different place other than the one bearing the burden of the tabernacle. You have bought into a lie that hinders the advancement of righteousness because if you're in this room and you're involved, if you, no matter how insignificant hell's told you your ministry is, I can't carry it alone. Three guys can't carry it. We've all got to get on the same page and realize one man can be the pastor. Another a man can lead this another but I wish I was with some people and I know I am that stood at an altar years ago and raised their hands and said Lord I'll say yes no matter what you ask me to do if I've got to be the one to pay the bills if I've got to be the one to dig the pit if I've got to be the one to march and pray whatever it is I just want to see the box move I just want to see revival I said, I just want to see revival. Moses' father-in-law said to him, son, he said, son, if you keep trying to do it all by yourself, he says, you will surely, verse 18 of 18 of Exodus, you're going to wear away both you and the people. Delegation is not to save me. He wasn't delegating to save just Moses. His follow, one of the greatest leadership passages in the Bible, looks at him and says, you're an amazing preacher, and you're a great leader, and you're filled with wisdom, but you're not just going to kill yourself. The dream will die. Let's say this. If we don't all work together, we're not fulfilling Pastor Tuttle's dream because something in me says... That I'm not the only one that's closed their eyes and seen a building packed with people that loved holiness. I, I just feel like there's a witness in my spirit that says, well, I said, I feel like there's a witness in my spirit. Somebody else that says, yeah, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it. I'll do whatever it takes. Give me something. I just, I'll move it. I want to go. I want to be a part of it. I, I don't care what part, just, well, preacher, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do while we're doing this? I'll tell you what I do. I'm going to get behind my ironing board and I'm going to start preaching and I'm going to keep praying and I'm going to look across the stains and I'm going to see a bigger building filled and God's going to let me see. He's going to let me see how to reach your children. He's going to let me see how to reach your baby. He's going to let you see how we reach every drug addict. Come on, somebody. Let's bear the burden of the tabernacle. Let's advance righteousness. Let's advance holiness. It's not time to lay down. It's time to get up. It's not time to quit your ministry. It's time to pick it up, to pick it up. And after one gets weary on that side, there'll be a young man. The average age up here is about 45. I need some young men to get up here. Give me some young men, some, some guys under about 25. Get up in here. Are y'all gonna help us bury the burden? Come on, get up in here. Pastor, we're gonna help you carry the burden. We're gonna lift it. And we're going to grow together. If quitting is in your vocabulary, I need you to leave. Because we're, we're carrying such a burden, we can't afford to go to the next chapter with people who aren't committed. You're welcome to come and visit, but if you're taking, come on, if you're in this just to try it out until it doesn't feel good anymore and you got to get a fresh start somewhere else, not trying to be ugly, we love you. Come drink coffee and pay $8 for it. But friend, don't you put your hand to the plow and look back. Don't you give up. You...
There's somebody in this room that needs to make a commitment that I'd rather be a part of a grand dream than be the star in a mini dream. I'd rather be a part of a great work than to be a part, come on, of just a puddle. Make me God a small fish in a big ocean. I don't have to be a whale in a puddle. I want to be a part of the greatest thing that God has ever done in the earth. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. I want you to lift your hands. There's a fresh fall anointing coming into this room. There's a fresh desire to give. There's a renewed Fakora Messiah commitment. You're committing to the cause. You're committing to righteousness. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to get with brothers with brothers, sister with sisters, group of you. And I want you to link up arm in arm. I said, I want you to link up arm in arm. And as we advance forward, there's some of you in the house that could carry more weight. And it's time you pick up the weight. Some of you have been thinking about laying it down and you need to, you need to repent and say, no, I'm going to keep moving the promise forward. I'm going to be a bearer of the tabernacle as we advance the enemy will come sowing discord and division Ah, but God right now tonight wants to unite the body and say uh, preacher I don't know what's going to happen next I don't know how it gets paid for I don't know how we advance it I don't have to know. Here's what I know. Just make sure, preacher, that you don't know because if God knows the vision, then we know it's a God vision. And I say, God, you can reveal it to me one step at a time. Reveal where we go next. I don't have to. And as he reveals the next step, we'll take the next step, Eastgate Church. And as he reveals the next one, we'll take the next one. But we refuse to stay where we are. Come on, grand memories. Yes. Wonderful heritage, yes, but the best is before us. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither is it entered into the heart of man that which the Lord has prepared. He's prepared. I want you to begin to pray over your neighbor. Begin to pray over them as an individual. Begin to pray over them, over their ministry and their family. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm gonna be a bearer of the burden. I'm gonna be a bearer. I know you wanna be blessed, but the bigger the blessing, the heavier the weight. I know we want to be blessed, but the more the blessing, the bigger the burden. But God, you can trust us. We'll bear the burden of the tabernacle. We'll bear it and we'll bear it together. I want you to begin to pray for Vider in Southeast Texas. Don't let go of your neighbor. Begin to pray for your church, Eastgate Church. Come on, we pray for the world. We pray for the missionaries. Uh, but right now, I want you to begin to pray over this place. Uh, pray over our building. Pray over the vision. Uh, begin to bless it. Uh, if you don't know what to pray, open your mouth and let tongues begin to come out of you. Uh, ooh, begin to speak things that are not as though they are. Uh, begin to declare. Come on. Uh, begin to declare it as though it's already begun. Uh, Commit to the sacrifice of bearing the burden. God, I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing. It will be, God, this is your house. It is a place where your glory dwells. We will refuse to be a stagnant place, but we will be a river 
a river that washes away the pain of the broken heart, a river that flows and brings life to the dry and parched souls of our city. We will be a river, a source, a spring, a place of coolness and refreshing. It will be out of our bellies. It will flow a river, river of living water. Let it flow, rivers, let it flow. Come on, God has been calling you into ministry. Just because you don't have a microphone doesn't mean you're not called. You've got to read, let God redefine your ideas of ministry. He wants to reshape it right now. Come on, I apologize for whoever told you that you weren't being used if you weren't in the mic. They lied to you. Come on, if there's anything, we need to advance this. We need somebody to pick up a rope on a handle and say, I'll pick up the burden. I'll take up the slack. I'll step in. I'll step in and be. God, I'll be what you've called me to be. I'll advance righteousness in an unrighteous world. I'll live holy when it's not popular. I'll preach with my life without a word even spoken. I will be. I will be. Somebody shout yes. Here's the beauty. All the burden doesn't have to be on eight men. But if each one of us, if you'll take, if you'll take the kids and if you'll take the men's, do I have to beg? There's plenty of ministry. This one's taken, but there's plenty of ministry. going forward There's still ministry available. Oh, look, there's all kinds of ministries in that box. Yeah, that's, yeah, you won't get a lot of credit for those. They're at the bottom. Yeah, nobody's going to probably tag you on the internet. You won't get your picture taken carrying that, but, but carry it. Each one of us will just take a small part. This thing can be bigger than anything we've ever seen. It doesn't hang on one man. Yes, it's one man that God speaks to. We can't have multiple visions or you have division. It's a singular vision that God gives to a man. But it's a mass of people that say, if all I can carry is a linen cloth, I'll carry one of the cloths. If all I carry is one little spike. I'll carry the spike. But I'm going to advance this thing forward. And at the end of my life, I will have constructed something for the glory of God. I'll be Bezalel who built the altar. 
What a heritage. He left his children. You don't even know his name, but the Bible says he was the first that was filled with the Spirit of God. He wasn't a prophet, a preacher. He was a carpenter, a man that built something. It was him that Solomon referenced years later and said, bring the altar. He didn't just said, bring the altar. He said, bring the one that Bezalel built. Oh, how his children must have held their heads high, not because their dad was a prophet, a preacher, a leader, a Levite, because he was a man with a hammer and a desire to work. And he did. And his legacy was one that he constructed something that saved a generation. And we speak of it to this very day. Your life doesn't need a spotlight or a microphone. You just need a willingness to pick up a hammer and say, I'll be a part. I'll be a small part in a big picture. Because God, we're advancing something. And when we construct it, your glory will fill it. Lives will be changed. And every miracle that takes place is because you bore the burden of the tabernacle. And every soul that goes down in the waters of baptism is because you bear the burden of the tabernacle. And every marriage that is saved is because you bore the burden of the tabernacle. You bore the burden of the tabernacle. If you're available, I want you just to lift your hands across this house. Father, I'm available. I'm available to what you call me to be. I'm available to advance the greatest mission ever known to man to establish the government that will never have an end. I, I God, am willing to construct an altar. I'm a carpenter, so let me build. I'm a plumber, so let me plumb. I'm an electrician, so let me do the electrical. I'm a painter, let me paint. I'm a singer, let me sing. I'm a, I can teach the children and work the nursery. I, I can upgrade a vacuum. I can clean the bathroom. I, I'll work the coffee shop. I'll get in the bookstore. I'll serve in the school. I'll, I'll just be a part. But I'm going to lift the burden so that the mission can move forward. I'm going to advance and bear the burden of the tabernacle. Now God wants to give us strength. I'm going to pray for strength into your body, your mind, your emotions, and your family. For what lies before us is daunting. We're aware of that. But I'm thankful that he has gone before us and sent his angels. And now I want you to lift your hands because strength is going to come upon you. As you've surrendered yourself. God, I surrender my vision to your vision. I surrender my dreams. God, it's not Los Angeles. It's not what I necessarily thought when I was 15. It's maybe a little town in southeast Texas, but our dreams are coming and its goals are big. And here we stand tonight and I surrender what I thought was needed in order to advance this thing. And I say, oh God, if you can use anything, I stand available. I once again, I once again, I rededicate. I wonder if you could recommit that pledge that says, Lord, yes, yes. If it's leading the choir, yes. If it's singing the solo, yes. If I'm the tenor section, yes. Whatever it is, my answer is yes. If I work in the office, yes. If I make calls, yes. If I'm in the care center calling those missing, yes. Whatever it is. My answer is Now put your hands together and give God praise You get to say yes to the greatest calling The greatest and most high anointing Hallelujah Somebody shout victory Look at your neighbor say, I love you. Look at the other neighbor say, let's bear the burden of the tabernacle. Why don't you just put your hands together and give God praise. There's a spirit of unity that swept in this building and the devil is a liar. Come on, I said the devil is a liar. We're going to stick together. We're going to advance the greatest cause known to man. We're going to advance righteousness. It's going to happen.